Thank you for being here. I am incredibly excited to be here. I really appreciate the fact that we're bringing together practitioners in the space and survivors and researchers um, all uh, in the same room. I'm curious, just to kind of start, can people sort of wave if they're from the more practitioner, um, NGO, human trafficking space versus researcher space? So let's do, okay. Yes, and then researcher, more on the technology and research side. Okay, so sounds great. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Nadia Bliss. Um, I'm the director of Global Security Initiative at Arizona State University. I'm also um, an executive um, committee member for the Computing Community Consortium. Um, I am um, very much not an expert in human trafficking um, at all. Um, I am an expert in sort of security-focused research and development. Most of my career has been predominantly with the Department of Defense, Intelligence Community, and Department of Homeland Security. Um, and as I mentioned, I identify very strongly as a computer scientist. Um, that's what I am by training. And one of the things that I feel we've um, haven't done so well as computer scientists as A, connect to applications. So I think um, there's a tendency in our discipline to uh, develop technology sometimes for the technology's sake. So I really appreciate this sort of event where we're really focused on the application. The other thing that I, um, I think we can do better as a community is um, think about abuses. Um, and abuses of how technology can be used uh, nefariously. And that's something that has come up uh, particularly, I really appreciated the Annie Cannon's uh, presentation because everything that we're talking about here in this session, hidden populations, potentially could also be used um, against the populations that uh, we're trying to help. Um, so this is a hot house session. We encourage a ton of interactivity. Um, we're also expecting uh, questions online. So please don't be shy. Please ask your questions, raise your hand. If you are asking questions, just remember uh, to use the microphone. I'm gonna hand it off to our first speaker in a second and then I'm gonna go stand over there and give our speakers signals when uh, the time's up. But again, I'm, I'm really excited to have you here and looking forward, uh, looking forward to the discussion. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shannon Stewart uh, from Global Fund to End Modern Slavery. Um, and I'm gonna hand over the microphone to her. And uh, she's been a research scientist with MIT before. She's worked a lot on labor trafficking, lots of statistical models and research models. Um, and here you go, we're very excited to have her. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for inviting me. Um, so, today I'm just going to give everyone a brief overview of what GFEMS does because we're a pretty new organization. I'm going to talk about two of our projects in prevalence estimation and um, then just quickly um, the use of technology in the fight against slavery. So, um, this slide is about the challenges that many of you are probably already quite familiar with. Um, for implementers, those would be things like limited funding, short timelines, excessively high expectations, mission creep, and limited research budgets. And then for donors, um, we find that there's an unclear relationship between the amount of money invested and the results. Um, and of course, they want to see fast results and sustainable improvements. Um, and there are also competing theories of what works and limited data and evidence in this field. So GFEMS has five activity areas that are meant to address these issues. Um, the first is to increase resources, which I think kind of speaks for itself. Um, the second is to ensure robust assessment of impact. Um, the third, to fund transformative programs, and that means coordinating across our grantees in activity spaces and in geography to try to harmonize what they're doing and create a, a more holistic approach. Um, fourthly, engage the private sector because a lot of these solutions we want eventually to be adopted and owned by the private sector. And then fifthly, to engage governments for the same reason where um, it makes sense to align national priorities and ultimately um, create some sense of co-ownership with those governments. And then there are a ton of words on this slide, but I'm only going to talk about this line here. Um, these actions are sort of divided into three um, areas. 
of funding, those would be increasing the effective rule of law, um, business investment and business engagement, and finally, sustained freedom, reintegration, um, alternative livelihoods. So, um, so to get closer to the topic of this uh, particular session, I'm gonna talk about two of our prevalence estimation projects. Um, overall, the, before I came to the fund, they sort of did an assessment of what promising methodologies were out there for prevalence estimation. They talked to 70 experts and identified four high potential methodologies. Those would be the network scale-up method, longitudinal migration tracking, um, mobile or web based respondent driven, driven sampling and predictive modeling. And um, we have studies in each of these areas. I'm gonna focus on the first two. Those would be the network scale-up method and longitudinal migration tracking. And in particular, um, we have a project in the Vietnamese apparel industry using the network scale-up method. And then in India, tracking 100,000 migrant laborers. Um, using mo mobile platforms. Okay, so the first um, study that I'm gonna talk about is the network scale-up method. And just to give you a brief overview of how that works, um, it was developed in the HIV AIDS research space, and it surveys the mainstream population, that is just the general population that we're interested in, um, and asks respondents first about their knowledge of reference populations where we can get good numbers. So those would be things like, how many people do you know who had a baby girl in 2017? Or who work in, you know, for example, the printing industry? And we use that number to sort of simulate their social network. And then we also ask, how many people do you know who work in the garment industry? Of those people who works more than 10 hours a day, of those people, are any of them confined while they're at work? Um, to get a little more insight into those hidden populations. And um, we're testing whether this method yields similar ro robustness to previous studies, and our goal is to complete it in a three-month time frame. And we're also um, using respondent-driven sampling, and the innovation here is that instead of doing face-to-face -face paper surveys or enumerator-led surveys, we're using um, mobile platforms to engage people remotely. And again, we hope that we can shorten the length of an RDS, RDS study to three months and reduce the cost. Um, so that um, pilot in Vietnam, um, we've pushed out 2,500 surveys. We did it at a five time cost reduction and a three and a half time time reduction. Um, compared to the status quo, and we hope to be able to improve that further in our next iteration. Um, we reached people in Vietnam on Facebook, and we compared that to um, simultaneous face-to-face -face surveys that were enumerator-led. And um, what we found there is that um, both methods showed demographic biases in the respondents we were able to reach. And I've, they're plotted here. Um, the Facebook respondents are in blue, the face-to-face -face are in orange, and we find that neither of them are quite representative of the um, Vietnamese age demographics, which are the white circles. Um, after we refined this data a little bit to get rid of nonsense responses, um, this went down a bit, um, but we still saw a bit of a bias towards younger people. Um, we found that the remote sample better fit a linear scale-up factor, meaning um, we expect that scale-up factor that we infer to be, you know, roughly the same across populations. We can deal with a little bit of variation, but um, in the face-to-face -face surveys, we really didn't see a very good correlation there. And uh, probably the reason for that is that um, in our face-to-face -face survey, so they're compared here on the right. Those are our Facebook respondents, and in orange are the face-to-face, -face, and we found that um, the face-to-face -face pilot gave significantly more zero responses on questions about sensitive populations, um, like for instance, people in forced labor or men who have sex with men. And then the second study I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna try to be really brisk here, um, 
So don't try to take all of this in, but uh, the point of this is that we're tracking people who go through a seasonal migration and they um, hit different uh, sort of choke points um, where our pool of potential migrants um, migrates through labor brokers and um, of those, some of them fall into forced labor. And um, our migration tracking is um, trying to understand whether any of these four interventions, entitlements, using licensed recruiters, um, training or micro con contractors can reduce the prevalence of forced labor in those populations. We're tracking them using call centers um, to en engage them remotely and uh, we expect to stay in touch with these people for I think up to a year um, to, to understand you know, what their experience was through that migration. Um, this is in its early stages, so I don't have much more to say about that. But um, And then briefly, uh, I'm going to go over just a high-level view of some of the other ways we're using technology in the fight against slavery. Um, so we're putting a lot of energy and investment behind getting really good prevalence estimates um, to understand if we build on that, are we are we actually making improvements or are we creating problems elsewhere? Um, one of my big projects as a data, scienti data scientist is um, detecting forced labor in apparel supply chains using predictive modeling. Um, similarly, using operational data to help companies assess the risk of forced labor in their supply chains. Um, and then uh, we're starting up projects using AI to reduce the demand for online sex, sex trafficking um, to sort of further anti-money laundering efforts in partnership with um, financial institutions and law enforcement. Um, protecting migrant workers who go abroad using technology similar to that mi longitudinal migration tracking and um, developing a comprehensive environmental and social good screening tool. Um, so with that, I would be glad to take questions. Super interesting. Thank you for the talk. Uh, what do you mean by using AI to reduce demand for sex trafficking? Um, so that project is uh, not fully under my portfolio. It's worked on by someone else on the team. So um, I guess the beginnings of it are understanding the driver drivers of commercial sexual exploitation of children um, by surveying buyers. Um, and then after that, based on what we learned, we're hoping to, um, hmm. I'm not sure I can fully answer it, I'm, I, but I'll okay. put you in touch with one, one of my colleagues. Hi, I'm interested based on the uh, supply chain and the business sector. Can you tell us a little bit more about that assessing of risk? and also APRO supply chain and also ESG screening. They're all kind of quite they related to corporate. Yes, they, those are related. So um, my background actually is um, understanding uh, the risk of adulteration in business supply chains. So I came from a background where I was looking at adulteration of medicine. And um, what I found there was that there were operational supply chain characteristics that were basically formed by the um, result of trying to hide that activity. And those would be things like having an unusually high amount of entropy in your supply chain, that is many different players and an unusually deep supply chain compared to your competitors. Um, and those would be sort of risk factors that would um, sum to, s to create a decision support tool to sort of prioritize someone who who's job is to um, you know, assign audits or law enforcement, for instance. Um, and so we could rank companies by the accumulation of these operational risk factors and then show it to somebody and say, you know, maybe these ought to be inspected. Thank you. 
is that uh, for the audience here is that uh, I ask this question mainly because, uh, for example, in the UK, we now gone through a lot about the Modern Slavery Act. And then Section 54 is all about transparency and supply chain. And California, you have that act is uh, for quite some time. And Australia is just about uh, passing the bill. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a huge, huge demand um, especially to some extent uh, from the commercial sector and also that's why I talk about ESG. So there's a huge opportunity for uh, data science and AI work in this area. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I was just going to introduce our uh, next speaker. Uh, Dr. Sam Blazek comes to us from IST Research. He's the chief scientist there and he works on technology, algorithms, and uh, work close to support both humanitarian and security missions. So I'm going to hand this off to Dr. Blazer. Uh, so, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm the chief scientist and the director of R&D at IST Research. Uh, my biggest passion as a researcher is to study the ways that people behave online and look at how that's similar to and different from the uh, ways that people behave offline. In so far as we work on counter-human trafficking research and operations, uh, I can say that as a scientist, that's been both difficult and fascinating, to say the least. So a little bit about IST. Uh, so we're a small mission-driven company based in Virginia. And uh, our mission is to enable engaging with hard-to-reach populations and to get valuable information from hard-to-reach places. In order to do that, uh, there's a large technical component involved. Basically. We want to recruit and communicate with people across as many different platforms and communication protocols and channels as we possibly can. And we want to do that reliably and affordably. So that ranges from recruiting respondents via print advertising or radio uh, in places like the DRC to monitor Ebola outbreaks, to sending out surveys via SMS and WhatsApp, to assessing public attitudes about issues on social media platforms like Twitter. We enable all that engagement and collection, and this is the company part, uh, and provide all the resulting data and analytics to end users through a software product called Pulse. Pulse is kind of a one-size-fits-all collection, engagement, and analysis interface and platform. So now that that's out of the way, uh, I want to primarily talk about our data collection and engagement experiences and capabilities. Uh, and our hidden population estimation efforts related to fighting modern slavery. These broadly uh, align with um, insights from the DARPA Memex program, as well as our work with uh, Shannon and the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery. And at the end, uh, I'll go over a few sort of recently developed analytics uh, that help us find signal in large, noisy data sets. So the initial research question here was about informal economies. Basically, can we learn interesting facts uh, from all of these public advertisements that go up online and are only online for a couple minutes or maybe a couple days and then get taken down? Ultimately, that became the DARPA Memex program. DARPA Memex was initially focused on counter sex trafficking, so our initial data collection approach was basically to collect every single ad that we could possibly find uh, for commercial sex online. After that, we extracted the emails, the phone numbers, uh, the photos, and we mapped the co-occurrences of these data points across ads and over time. The network graphic here is from the first 850,000 ads oops, sorry, that we collected. And uh, this graphic is really cool, and everybody loves network graphics, right? But uh, more interesting than that is what happens when you use data and information from somewhere else and connect it to the data that you learn from the open source. So here's the analogy, right? 
imagine that you've been looking at this network all day. You see some cities here, uh, Hong Kong, Dubai, Chongqing, Singapore, Shenyang. Um, and you get the connections. There's some high between the centrality points, et cetera. You maybe even you're starting to think of a story. Now imagine instead uh, that instead of a 2D graphic, this is like a 3D pile of spaghetti that's floating in the middle of the room. And you can look at it from where you're sitting right now, and you can also look at it from where I'm standing and from over there. And it's going to look different depending on where you're looking at it from. You're going to see different things in the structure. You're going to see different connections. That's ideally kind of what happens when you provide these networks to counter-slavery organizations with their own intelligence and their own investigatory capabilities. And if you're wondering whether I'm kind of crazy with that analogy, um, maybe. Uh, but I'll give you a better example in the next slide. So sometimes during the Memex program, we ran internal investigations. Uh, this is an example of one of those which came back to our attention recently. Essentially, we'd look for uh, large networks that included uh, evidence of exploitation, uh, things like the uh, migration of a single individual escort across a number of different cities uh, or even countries. Um, we would look for you know, certain cues in the ads, certain language cues, things like that, um, a lot of which actually came from Dominique Rosepowitz over there, who was one of the subject matter experts who helped us with this. Uh, then we'd look for evidence of organization, so something like a single phone number or a single email address or an external web link across a large number of cities. Uh, this network in particular had all of the above. So we compiled spreadsheets of every ad and data point that we knew was connected to this network, everything that we suspected was connected, and so on uh, in decreasing orders of sanity. Um, the ads often link to external escort websites. There were actually 60 plus different websites in this network, um, almost all of which were registered by someone named Wei Xuan Zhou. There were over 300 different phone numbers in this network. It touched on all of the sort of hot spots in the US for sex trafficking, um, the major urban areas like San Francisco, Houston, DC, New York. It reached into Canada. So this became a behemoth, and we were really worried about whether or not any given regional law enforcement office would even want to try to parse the thousands of ads that we found in this network. So Ryan Patterson, our CEO, who's sitting in the back, uh, passed this on to a contact at the Department of Justice. And unbeknownst to us, there was already an investigation underway on a small piece of this network. After sending over our findings on it, the existing investigation ballooned into a U.S. attorney-led RICO case. They've indicted six individuals so far following a series of arrests made by FBI Portland's Child Exploitation Task Force. They also obtained a database of customer interactions, over 30,000 of them, including customer phone numbers. So we're still holding our breath that a lot more arrests uh, could come soon from this. And this gets back to that analogy of looking at a network from another perspective, how the collection and indexing of open data can help piece together data and intelligence from elsewhere. All right, I'm gonna. Sam, can I ask you a question yeah. here um, on the previous chart? So, um, so I'm curious, right? So this is titled IT Tools Deployed to Identify Hidden Populations, and you've described kind of pretty advanced computer science, uh, subject matter expertise, domain expertise. So how did those different aspects contribute to basically the successful program that was here? Would you, see, would you say it's like the glue at the intersections or each thing individually? Sorry, program or investigation? In this particular mm -hmm. So basically, uh, in this particular example, you have a large collection of public data that you wouldn't actually see structure in unless you were to collect and index all the selectors over time, right? So once we did that, we actually saw a lot of structure emerging from this network that if you just looked on back page or whatever in a given day, you wouldn't have seen all that structure. Uh, based on that, we looked at the images and there are a number of indicators that you might see in images. Um, whether they're authentic or not would be a good one first off, but um, evidence of a single individual, like I said, who's being moved between cities, um, use of so-called pimp language. Um, so there are a lot of sort of terms around that, um, using different terms for dollars or for different types of encounters and things like that. Um, there are a lot of kind of indicators. This was actually uh, largely based on Asian massage parlors. 
Um, so there are other issues that you might kind of keep in mind specifically for that type of counter-trafficking effort or organized crime um, effort. So yeah, kind of, kind of a lot of inputs there, but it, it was a combination of open data, uh, things that, t that triggered our spidey senses, and then passing this to an organization that had a lot of closed data that we didn't even know about. And so they saw this, and suddenly their closed data started looking very different. You okay taking questions in the middle? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Since I started. And no, this <laughs> is because now my now my time limit is broken, so I can do whatever. <laughs> I want. Yeah. It seems like those codes change pretty often in terms of pimp language, etc. How did you keep up with those, and did you discover anything about how those spread through a community so that everybody knows that, for example, a closed rose means one thing versus another? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So. Uh, basically, all of this was provided to end users in law enforcement, at agencies, at NGOs. So by and large, uh, those people kind of worked with us to provide that information. Uh, on top of that, as part of the MIMEX program, there was a significant natural language processing component. So there were people who basically it was their job within the program to say, okay, well, this has 40 roses, or this uses this emoji. Um, or this is how they're obscuring phone numbers in a particular way. Um, why don't we take the initiative and build a classifier that recognizes other ways that that could happen? Um, yeah. Um, hi, thank you. I just have a question to clarify. Um, when you're saying that you're looking for indicators like closed roses in certain language, are you saying indicators that someone is being trafficked versus consensually participating as a sex worker who's an adult? Or are you saying you're looking for indicators that they're actually trying to sell sex so in general? Given that the, it, these are all ads for sex, we, yeah, we took that okay. as, yeah. Um, okay. But uh, it was indicators for trafficking. And okay. to that point, you raise a really good point, which is that some people may simply use that slang because right. it's what the consumers are familiar right. with. Right. So Thank that's you. not a solid indicator. It I may be a risk indicator, but it's not anything that's confirmatory. That's totally true. Perfect. Um, yeah, and I mean, on that, on that note, um, there, there's, again, just so much to be drawn from looking at other data sources, right? So one of the groups that uh, we, we looked at, like, dozens of networks like this and kind of pushed them out to different, different organizations. One of the ones that I found um, just, you know, Googling the phone number involved, I found a Google Plus profile with a photo of a young woman with the caption that literally just said, my sex slave. Um, and so we were like, oh, well, we didn't really know if there were indicators in the ad, but that's an indicator. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's totally a matter of what, um, you know, a collection of different risk factors. And at the end of the day, uh, th this is not algorithmic decision making, it's decision support. So, yeah, at the end of the day, there has to be a human analyst who really makes the, the call on what to do about any of this. I was just wondering if Polaris had provided some of the information or if you'd been working at all with Polaris. I know that they'd been doing work around illegal Asian brothels as well and massage businesses and just wondered the level of collaboration or if there was any there. So on this one, there was, uh, this was just internally discovered. This was through uh, uh, th three of our analysts, Leah, Curtis, and Danielle, who's actually here. Um, and their discovery just within the large data collection. Um, that being said, Polaris uh, was involved. They were one of the pilot organizations for the MEMEX program. I sat at Polaris, I think, two or three days a week and familiarized them with the software and kind of worked with them. So there are definitely outputs there and, and other results, but this one in particular I do not think was connected to Polaris at all. Uh, how do you deal with um, images and the, the fact that they can be used to convey information, uh, you know, through things like, you know, clothing choices and or um, even something as, as easy as hiding text in an image instead of uh, having it in a form that can easily be indexed? Sure. Um, well, I guess I'll skip around a little bit on the slides, uh, but, or should I just put a pin in that and get, I'll get to you in a moment? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, we'll get to that. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I just shut down discussion. <laughs> uh, so a bit more on the remote estimation of hidden populations. Uh, so 
this is a totally different way that we're looking at how technology uh, and basically the flourishing of digital communication uh, can help us as we fight to end modern slavery. So we've been working with the Global Fund uh, for a bit over a year now to pioneer new approaches to survey engagement in the interest of tracking potential victims as well as estimating prevalence of various forms of exploitation. So we're engaged in five efforts in three countries uh, so far, and there will be some additional ones coming soon, I believe. Uh, these include longitudinal migration tracking, prevalence estimation, uh, primarily via, as Shannon mentioned, the network scale-up method and respondent-driven sampling. Um, from this initial pilot, which was on the apparel manufacturing industry in Vietnam, and this was uh, basically the engagement initially went out over uh, Facebook, over social media, I think also Instagram, actually. Um, it was a recruitment ad for a survey, and this is a snapshot with no information provided, because it's not published yet, of uh, some of our estimates. Um, so as you can see, uh, the estimates, these are mapped to reference groups for which we have the actual data. We know from the Vietnamese census, you know, how many of them there are. Um, and you can see the estimates track overall pretty well. Um, the aim in this pilot was a 10x reduction in cost and time, and we did not reach that, uh, but we feel that's really within reach at this point. Uh, one hurdle to this sort of approach, which um, will certainly come up, is the topic of representativeness. So if you recruit people for a survey over Facebook, um, well, you have a collection of Facebook users. What does that mean in the population, right? Um, so there, th I think that's a, it's a long and complex discussion. Um, the network, network scale-up method in particular, uh, I think it's, uh, it's really not known yet how much that actually accounts for uh, bias within someone's social network on its own. It's trained to account for differences in someone's network structure and it scales uh, based on those differences. Uh, on top of that, um, there are other methods that you can still use a remote or digital approach to get at uh, a larger, uh, more representative group. So one of the other options here uh, that we've discussed quite a bit is network sampling. Um, essentially, what you could do in that case is you could recruit people off social media, and let's say in Vietnam, the footprint of Facebook and Instagram is maybe about 70% of the population, maybe a little bit lower than that, actually. Um, and then you ask those people, you say, well, we'll give you um, an additional incentive if you uh, send this via SMS to your friends. And uh, the friends, we'd say, you get another incentive for sending this to your friends, and so on and so on. And if you're familiar with respondent-driven sampling, that's kind of the beginning of RDS, right? Uh, recruitment waves via chain referral. And from that, um, you arrive at you know, network equilibrium or an independent sample of some population. In that case, it would be the population of people who have mobile phones in a country, uh, which in Vietnam is uh, close to about 95% of the population. So it's my final slide. Um, and this gets back to the question that you had about image analytics. Um, it's kind of the latest and greatest of just areas where we at IST have uh, found it useful to plug in AI or machine learning. Um, not representative of the whole industry. <laughs> um, but so there's uh, optical character recognition, or OCR, right here. Um, particularly, I think, since the Memex program and since we've seen a lot of attention on the online ad space, uh, many people have realized that it's maybe not a good idea to just put a phone number in plain text or an email address in plain text. So you might see it written on a post-it note in an image. Um, and then a human reader would know to call that number, but would uh, an algorithm that's extracting data from the text uh, and looking at the images, would it know to look at that number? Uh, there are other things that you can do, uh, like object detection and image-based uh, classification. So there are, thing, there are capabilities out there such as recognizing uh, what hotel a photo is taken in by the pattern on the carpet. This is one that you may have heard about before. Uh, also, whether or not you've seen someone's face before, if you have a database of, let's say, 500 million ads, um, and you don't know whether that face has been in the data before, maybe, do I recognize this person? That kind of came to mind when, when um, Dominique Rosepolis was speaking earlier, about maybe how, how would you find that person earlier? Well, if there's a photo of them, then it's possible that facial recognition might get you there. Uh, so on the left here, 
Um, this is, uh, well, it's hard to explain, but, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's uh, what we're calling an interlingual semantic processing, or interlingual semantic embedding. So the input data um, across all of these columns is uh, different categories in English. Basically, we took a bunch of uh, sentences and we said, these sentences collectively are like a category of intent or meaning that someone might say. So for example, um, we want to recruit people for a manual labor job, unskilled, need it tomorrow. Or we need people to work on this as soon as possible, time is of the essence. Or maybe for a different category, uh, we, ha we have to make the shipment ASAP. Uh, you know, there are big things happening and we need to move that cargo today. So those would express, you know, uh, migration or, or smuggling, as well as a sense of immediacy. Um, and the first one would be recruitment as well as immediacy. So those are sort of semantic categories that we would generate a, an embedding for, which is uh, in the neural net language, you know, creating a vector. And owing to some of the really, really cool um, breakthroughs in natural language processing, there are now interlingual embeddings. So we generated these category sentences in English. And these are all Russian. And we did not translate any of this text ever. So in short, this uh, embedding system is able to handle over 100 different languages without actually costing the you know, pricey Google Translate or whatever your translation API or you know, whatever you're using for translation. So I think one of the great use cases for that is if you're starting to research a new case that deals with labor trafficking or smuggling and uh, the folks who are involved or the data set that you're using, uh, they speak, say, Portuguese. Um, and you know, we don't know where to start looking for good pieces of data in that. We might uh, take our English demo sentences about moving cargo, about hiring manual labor and what needs to happen now, about other sort of indicators that there might be something happening on that side. Or, you know, uh, indicators of risk. So someone saying, I can't find a job, I'm gonna give up. Or I don't know what I'm doing, like I need help, I'm running out of money, I'm gonna be homeless. Um, these sorts of things. And then basically uh, use the encoder to process that data into the same neural space, sort by how close is this to a category. And then, you know, if something's a 90% match to we need manual labor, a thousand people tomorrow, that might go right at the top of an analyst dashboard next time they log in. And then the final example, um, real quick, is this one on the bottom right. Um, this is our kind of state of the art in terms of risk alerting. So you're saying that language stuff is really cool, but is it actually good? Does it work? Um, so this graphic is our findings when predicting the risk of a public act of violence. So we processed a large number of posts to measure uh, several different English categories, like expressing a sense of anger, um, expressing a sense of immediacy, uh, using quote unquote like operational language, like uh, locked and loaded, stuff like that. Um, and then we use that to train forecasting models to try to predict uh, an act of public violence about five days in advance, between two and five days in advance. Um, we built a lot of models and we looked at consensus between the models as to when something might happen. And this was uh, one of the communities we studied, um, in particular in, in a part of India. Um, and the consensus mo uh, between the models basically maps uh, pretty much exactly to these red circles, which is when there actually was an act of violence. So that use case is only partly related. I think there was some talk earlier about the relationship between conflict and modern slavery. Um, but I think there, the sort of key point here is there's no reason why this work um, or any other type of planned activity or expressions of someone who desperately needs help um, and doesn't know, you know what they're gonna do the next day, um, there's no reason why that sort of risk alerting uh, can't fit into something like this, which operates between any given language, don't need to learn a language or translate to do it. So we're at a point where I think if you can find a good collection of relevant public data, whether it's Instagram, you know, Twitter, whether it's what, whatever people are posting in their, their local app um, or platform, uh, 
we think there's a, with, with current AI and NLP and computational semantics, there's a good chance that you can kind of find out what's the issue here and even maybe how urgent is it or when's it gonna start getting really bad. Um, so that's, yeah, that's it here. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, I have a, a kind of two-part question. The first is in terms of leveraging publicly available human data regarding sex trafficking. How is what you're doing uh, different from uh, other tools on the market like uh, by Thorn and by Marinus Analytics? I'm just curious. Uh, that's part one. And part two is can you tell us a little bit about the structure of your organization and your funding model? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so at least as far as uh, how we might compare it to a, a, a Thorn or, um, you know, products from, from, I think you mentioned Marinus. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I would say I don't think we necessarily are trying to compete in the same space at all. Um, our big emphasis as a company and, and our main interest is how to engage with any given person anywhere. Um, if there's a group of people out there who are impossible to get in contact with. We have no idea how, no one's been able to do it, and we'd really like to know what's happening to them, do they need help, et cetera. Um, that's kind of our number one mission, is uh, do these folks need help, um, and, and how the heck are we gonna be able to talk to them? So to that end, we're constantly looking at things like, uh, you know, SMS is, as, a, as a communication protocol is dying. Uh, it, SMS probably won't exist in, I don't know, a short number of years. <coughs> So if that's the case, then where are people moving to? Are they using, you know, in some places WhatsApp, in some cases th this other thing? Um, how do we plug into all those things to actually talk to people? So I'd say for us, there's a much greater emphasis on kind of being able to reach out and talk to any given person. Um, and, and I think from the kind of counter-trafficking assessment side, um, we are, I mean, it's, it's, it's a use case. Um, we're really interested in collecting data that has merit to um, whoever the end user is and, and you know what they need, well, we can collect it. We built the scraping infrastructure for, for Memex and I, I think that's probably collection over public data is one of our strong points. Um, but it's, it's totally tailored to, to use cases. Um, and and as, as you said, I had a question about funding? Or who f yeah, so uh, I would say we're probably about 80% funded by the US government. Um, and then maybe, no, maybe a little bit less, let's say 70%, um, and then about 20% um, NGO, 10% private. Our CEO is probably shaking his head at me for that, but <laughs> yes, he is. Okay, so I'm wrong on that, but something, something along those lines. Hey, first of all, awesome presentation, thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more to the language agnostic encodings and how that was built. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this originally came out of uh, something that we found through Google, which was uh, a model they released called the Universal Sentence Encoder. Uh, the Universal Sentence Encoder actually wasn't well received, by and large, by a lot of practitioners, um, because when you would type a sentence in, it would, it just didn't look like it was really getting the meaning of what you were saying. So we ran the encoder over a huge collection of our own data. And uh, initially, we would type in things like, I want to kill everyone to see, oh, is this a data point that's, we're, we're going to find the, the tweets or the posts that uh, have someone saying something like that coming back. And actually, what it would come back with was other short sentences. So it was recognizing the length. Um, so there is a lot of kind of uh, figuring out what works for, the, for that particular encoder. And then from that, designing basically benchmarks uh, for some category. And the way that we do that is basically we encode a large number of sentences that we say, that we determine, usually with external help, uh, comprise some category of, of meaning or of a statement. Um, and we take the mean of that vector, so within the encoding space. Once we take the mean of the vector, you can just look at Euclidean distance from a new uh, document and compare its encoding to that encoding. So, and then you can just sort based on Euclidean distance, that sort of thing. Um, the interlingual component 
is not a, not through Google. Um, that's a, a separate thing that's just, I think came out maybe last month um, in terms of interlingual semantic embeddings. Um, and I'm trying to remember exactly the name, but I know if you Google interlingual semantic embeddings, um, there are existing models out there that can, that can get you started with it. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was just curious, I have uh, two quick questions. One is, um, in your work with Memex, I thought I had heard um, that they were potentially looking at also incorporating labor trafficking in the US, and I don't know if that has happened and if you could talk about that. And then also whether you could share any findings that you have so far from the work with the Vietnamese apparel industry. Yeah, uh, so Memex actually expanded to include a large number of domains, not even just uh, counter trafficking. So there was looking at patent trolls. Um, there was looking at uh, illicit supply chains for, you know, different types of technology items. Um, there was looking at labor trafficking as well, particularly for recruitment for overseas labor. Um, yeah, there were a large number of domains in Memex, um, and uh, at least as as far as the uh, initial findings on the um, on the prevalence estimation work uh, from Vietnam, I would defer to. Uh, the, the folks who are having us do it, uh, like uh, the Global Fund. <laughs> yeah. um, <coughs> so, so we're not releasing the numbers today, but the, the work is done. And I will say that it's consistent with other estimations of the same population. Uh, if you imagine that the industry is growing a little, uh, it's consistent. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for jumping in. We'll have a little bit more time for discussion after our uh, last speaker, Dr. Timiani from uh, UNU. Um, and she works in um, uh, migraine tech research, so please go ahead. Thanks for the introduction. Um, as Nadia said, my name is Hannah Timiani. Um, I work at UNUCS, so just to introduce that, I'm sure you're all aware of UNUCPR. Um, <coughs> so United Nations University has, I think, 11 institutes around the world. CPR is policy research, and we are computing and society. So the lab that I lead um, looks at using um, technology to support migrant workers in vulnerable situations. Um, the project that I'm going to be talking about is um, done in collaboration with an NGO out of Hong Kong called the Mekong Club, and we're funded by Humanity United and Freedom Fund. I've got a video that I'm going to ask them to start. Um, <coughs> please excuse the beginning because it's done for a general audience who might not know what modern slavery is, so you might do a bit of an eye roll, but <laughs> there is some meat coming. At a time when technology is widely used to provide solutions, a new app has been developed to help the victims of the fastest growing crime in the world, modern slavery. Slavery, often the result of human trafficking, affects more than 40.3 million people worldwide, with the highest prevalence in Asia, but victims remain widely unidentified. Slavery is hidden in plain sight, imposed upon vulnerable people who often have no awareness of their rights and no way to seek help. This is why the identification of victims by law enforcement and NGOs is the first crucial component of rescue operations. Assuming frontline responders know how to recognize suspicious situations, one of the main issues when it comes to identification of victims is language barriers. Victims of slavery are often migrants who have been trafficked or traveled to their workplace from another country. These people are deceived about the work conditions offered to them, trapped in that bondage, have no idea of their rights, and they have no way to communicate because they do not speak the local language. If they are approached by NGO workers or officials, but no translation service is available at that time, they are likely to lose the only opportunity they have to be identified and helped. Trust is also a big issue, as interpreters may be bribed or not sufficiently trained to correctly identify the victims. And then there is fear of reprisals. Victims are often interviewed near their ex 
exploiters or traffickers or know they're being watched so they will not speak up. The app we developed aims at being a cost-effective solution to all these challenges. A brand was developed to empower potential victims to identify themselves in a straightforward way. The app is downloaded on the frontline responders phone, but is ultimately a tool in a potential victim's hands. We work with several stakeholders to design an app that is user-friendly and appropriate for use within Thailand, the country where we're currently piloting. We developed screening questionnaires for different scenarios and translated them in the most common languages among migrant worker communities, including a number of dialects of Thailand and Myanmar. The questions are audio recorded and the app uses their responses to understand the vulnerability of their situation. This way, in a matter of minutes, we hope to give voice to people who would otherwise never have one. A price is currently being piloted in various regions to assess how technology could improve the identification of victims by NGO workers. Sampong Strakao and his team from the Labor Rights Promotion are testing a price in the Sumatsakan region. Another NGO testing a price is Stella Maris, who supports migrants in accessing legal and social services in addition to offering emergency shelter. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe I need to push the button. Okay, well, while the screen is coming back, um, I thought I'd just touch on a couple of um, pieces raised in that um, video. We started our work by trying to understand how technology could help um, frontline responders. So that's anybody who has that interfacing um, role with workers to check for vulnerabilities in their situation. Um, we started in 2017, at the beginning of 2017, with um, focus groups with frontline responders as well as survivors of exploitation to say what problems did they have. Some of these were raised, but the, um, the big ones were communication, because everyone speaks different languages, and privacy, um, because they're uh, if we think of the fishing sector in particular, the people are interviewed in front of their exploiters. And so, and even in worse situations on the sea inspections, when there's no translator involved or translator available, they ask the captain of the vessel to translate for his workers when he asks them if he is exploiting them. It just becomes ridiculous. So um, we wanted to say, these people are out there, how can technology help them? Um, so, uh, let me go to the next. So people have been using um, our current system in the field since March 2018, and we've got ongoing evaluations with NGOs in Thailand, but we're just about to start our pilot with um, the Thai government, so that's where the Thai Navy come in. I'm um, not sure if you know the Thai illegal fishing scene, but they have the Command Center for Combating Illegal Fishing, CCCIF, which is Ministry of Labor and Thai Navy together. 
So we have ongoing evaluations um, at Port and Sea, which is um, where the labour inspectors do their work, um, processing and manufacturing. So that's specifically seafood processing. We have another pilot which we're doing in Bangladesh, Vietnam, Thailand, Taiwan, um, within the fish, sorry, not the fishing, within the processing and manufacturing in supply chains. Um, I think we have five brands signed on to use within their own supply chains. Um, sexual exploitation um, with centers in Pattaya, Bangkok, and Chiang Mai, and forced begging. I put that there for completeness. We only have one NGO we found who actually works in, for in forced begging. Um, in Bangkok, and we're having not very much progress in that one. But for completeness, we were, <laughs> uh, or we are working with them. So uh, since um, March, we've had 1,387 recorded sessions. Um, I put a little star there to say, we don't know how many of these so far are them training each other. So we're not considering this like a data set that we want people to use. We, but in the next um, one month, we're going to start saying, okay, if you want to do this for training, this is a different app we're going to use. Um, so just a quick um, look at what we found so far. From the workers' perspective, um, they, we were worried that people wouldn't be able to understand the purpose of the interviews. Um, we start the, the app after they've selected their language by clicking on the flag with a bit of an introduction video which says who the person is, who's come to talk to them, what information we want to collect, are they happy to, um, to continue, so like a consent one. It also demonstrates how to use their um, app. So the app goes through a series of yes, no questions. Um, for example, do you have access to your ID documents? If you don't have it, are you able to retrieve them if you need them? Things like that. Um, and then um, they can respond, they can go back and forward through the questions, they can repeat questions, things like that. Um, so we were worried about identifying languages, what's the best way. Um, people had originally, in our stakeholder consultations, the different NGOs had, some had said, well, why don't you have a map and ask people to say where they're from. Um, turns out not, not everyone knows where they're from on a map. Um, so we went back to our flags. Um, the fr another problem with flags is what if you have Myanmar, which has like 300 languages altogether? So we use tribal flags rather than um, the country flag. Um, one thing that some of the workers had said, actually it was this dude in particular, that he's um, s s very, well basically he's illiterate and um, he struggles in, co in conversations with people because he feels pressure. He knows he's not very good at language in general. Um, and he was saying that because he's given the phone with headphones and all this stuff, he actually feels more control of the whole system. And it takes a little bit of pressure off immediately responding. And so he can go back and forward and figure out, okay, now I am actually ready to answer the question. Um, a control of the interview situation. Um, frontline responders themselves, they said that they appreciated that they could um, interview multiple workers at the same time whilst maintaining privacy. So this dude in the middle here, he's got his phone and his friend's phone, which he put the app on, and then he can give the phones out and headphones out to uh, different people, and then he can look at the um, vulnerability calculation at the end and then say, hey, I think I need to um, follow up on this guy with, it says debt bondage is a problem or withholding ID documents, this is a, a, a problem as well. Um, so from the communication side, this is some of the um, NGOs, what they do is they have a big volunteer network. So this um, NGO that we were visiting in particular, every Sunday they have 50 um, volunteers who come in, have a little bit of training, and then the volunteers go out to the community to talk to people, see if anyone needs help. And so this um, NGO, what they do is they train people on using a prize, and then the um, volunteers go out, talk to people, interview them, and then they um, refer um, cases that are highly vulnerable or vulnerable to their case management team. So it helps them to streamline the process so they can look at and um, uh, interview mul multiple people. So this is a very big um, quote, but really <laughs> what this is saying is, although they have some language expertise, it allows them to reach populations that they weren't able to reach otherwise. Um, 
um, privacy. Um, the way that cases are handled in the PIPO centers, the port in, port out um, inspections, what happens is all of the um, workers are lined up in a row and the um, labor inspectors will randomly, in theory, randomly select um, five or six people. They put them all together and they ask, has any of you been exploited? Has anyone you know, been beaten and all of that? Um, and often they put them in the back of a truck like this to do the um, interview. Um, to give them a bit of privacy. So I want to say they are trying and they are changing their practices. Instead of doing it all in a line in front of everybody, they at least take six people and put them in a track. So <laughs> it's, it's a good step forward. But what if the person in the track... Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. What happens with the data in the app? I'll get to that in a sec. Um, so um, the, pe the people in the track are asked the questions together. With the prize, what they're doing is they're using it, say, multiple phones with head, um, headsets again. What happens with the data is the data is associated with the, um, the frontline responder. So the frontline responder logs in, um, and then they get the anonymized data, so we don't collect anybody's name, ID, anything like that, no photos. Um, <coughs> and then it's the responses, so the yes-no responses and the location of the app sorry, the location of the interview um, that is collected on the frontline responder's phone. When they're next within um, network connection, they upload it to their own account so they can check it later on. We have some um, ideas of groups and orga within organizations, so your um, supervisor can have access to see how many um, interviews you've done, um, but we do things like we obscure the, the location, so we drop um, levels of accuracy in our GPS um, coordinate to try and protect some information. We went, uh, since we started in 2017 and we've been going through I think five or six series of consultations, so we talked to 170 something um, experts within Thai um, anti-human trafficking as well as the regional kind of human trafficking experts to say what kinds of information, how much information and um, on the one hand, people say if we can just take a photo of the people, then it allows us to follow on with the case management system. And then you have the other side who say, you know, who's going to, what if something gets hacked, you know? Um, and who's going to have access to this? So in the end, we don't do any photos. We don't collect anything that's identifying. And it um, reduces how useful the system could be. But we personally don't want to be the ones who have this information because we don't, it's an uh, untrusted system. Um, moving forward, so we kind of started this work really just trying to support the frontline responders um, to identify people, to bridge this communication problem. And then we realized that we have all of this information and you can, it's very fine grained, you know, so we can say for each person in each location, who said yes to this question? Um, and is it different in different sectors? And we did some reading and we saw this approach called Sentinel Surveillance. I'd love to talk to the Rights Lab people because I heard them saying that they're going to start working on epidemiology approaches, which is what Sentinel Surveillance is. Um, to say, if we have, I'm not sure how much people know about Sentinel Surveillance, let me quickly tell you. Um, if you have a disease, um, there are different ways of tracking it, right? you have active and passive ways. So a passive way would be to say, hey doctors, tell me every month how many people come in with this kind of flu or whatever. And then the doctors just report. Active tracking is when you, have you actively go out looking for cases. Sentinel surveillance allows you to say, I'm going to select um, very specific sites where there's a high, uh, high chance of coming in contact with people with this certain condition. And then in those sites, you have a lot of training, how to recognize um, the symptoms. And then you carefully um, get the information, anonymize information with as minimum information as possible from the different sites. And you can look at trends um, in the condition. So we're saying, what if we do this with human trafficking and labor exploitation broadly? Um, so that's what we were wor starting working on. And it also has some amazing ways where machine learning can come in to do this identification of trends. 
my background, I'm a computer scientist, so my PhD was like visualization and interaction and augmented reality and virtual reality. So I first of all was like, yay, information visualization, I love it. But I think there's quite a lot that machine learning can come in here. Um, so lovely to speak to anybody who wants to talk about this kind of side of, of thing. Hi there, uh, Aaron Phelps with the Freedom Fund. Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I was just curious if you could speak a little bit more. You mentioned that some you, you're partnering with some brands who are interested in using the app, and I was curious, and I would imagine that um, a worker who's been delivered the app by an NGO worker versus um, someone from their company would might have a different response. I'm curious what those kind of conversations look like there. Yeah, it is amazing how fast uh, auditor within a supply chain response. We have been working with the Thai government for ever, <laughs> it feels, to try and get them to roll out with the in the PIFO centers. And within a month, we get responses from within a supply chain um, of, would you like to participate? Yes, and this is how many auditors are going to take part, and this is ha where the next inspections are going to be and you guys can go for a field trip to come and observe how it's used and all this. So that's from within the supply chain. Um, and I guess it's because of all of these new laws that we see being passed everywhere that brands are now having to show how they are checking um, for labor violations. Hi, um, Heidi Cooper from Polaris. And this made me wonder if there's a way to adapt this to an online survey that doesn't need an auditor, thinking about some of the signals we get and how safe and secure this might potentially be, especially if, as Dr. Blazik says, SMS is going out of um, fashion. Yeah, so there, um, when we started our work, we really wanted to see how people are working in this space already. And there are those um, technologies that are like, report something that you think might be vol um, a case of human trafficking. So just the public facing ones, and then there's the individual f um, facing ones. You know, there are all the ones that say um, SMS's number, and they have surveys, like, you know, Labelink and Lula and all those guys. Um, so those ones were out there, and we saw that nobody was really interfacing with a frontline responder. Now, we wanted to um, go with them because we thought, if it's an individual who is asked these questions and then they, it turns out they're in a vulnerable situation, they didn't know for sure they were, they had a feeling, but um, this guarantees, but then they can't get out of the situation, well then how does that help anybody? So we said rather than doing that work, all of that work is very, um, it's, it's really required, th th there's a lot of ways of accessing this hidden population. But we wanted to say, I want to only work with people who have a way of helping those people exit if, um, if th they choose to exit. That's uh, one of the other parts of it I forgot to say. At the end of each of our question lists, we say, do you want to exit this situation? And so um, if they say no, well then we respect, we tell the frontline responders to respect um, their decision. Additional questions? Um, I was wondering if um, each of you can kind of comment, so on this notion of essentially, um, I guess I, I guess I would call it countermeasures, which I realize is not the right word, um, but I noticed that you know, I thought about it particularly when Sam was talking in context of you learn to detect something and then they change how it's obfuscated. So you have very different approaches. I mean, predominantly, Sam's working with open source data and Shannon, you're sampling, and um, you, know, you have an app. But how do you manage in this environment, essentially somebody, for example, blocking the app on a particular network? So how do you keep the head of whatever the other party's doing? Okay, so ours, okay, our approach is we're not interested in blocking from, like saying someone might block the app, but we're saying, patterns change, that's, we, that's what we're trying to do. We're gonna try and identify these changing patterns. So we've made the question list so you can easily add and remove questions. 
and add and remove languages. So within our um, sexual exploitation list in Pattaya, we have quite a good network of different NGOs who are just using it. And they say, you know, the current um, uh, kind of population who've come in are from uh, Swahili-speaking um, people. But we see there's a big rise in Colombians coming. So please add Spanish. So we get all the questions um, translated. They all go up there, and then the next time the frontline responder logs on, they get the new questions. Um, so in the same way, we can say, hey, we've noticed that this is a new practice that we've uncovered either by um, talking to the NGO workers themselves or by analyzing the information. And we say, okay, I'm now going to add a question about blah, blah, blah. Um, <coughs> so I guess I'll, I'll speak to this from two different angles. So first of all, um, I agree that the, these things can change pretty relatively quickly, and that is in fact one of the reasons that the fund is working so hard on getting to that two to three month window um, with our prevalence estimates and really trying to focus it down in time to see, you know, can we not only shorten the time of making an estimation, but also shorten the time needed between two prevalence estimates to see if the intervention is even working, right? Um, so. That's another reason that we're really driving towards remote engagement and um, trying to complete these studies as fast as possible. And then on the other hand, um, on the uh, using AI and machine learning on operational data, um, in my experience, those kinds of tools have to be continuously maintained, and um, like someone needs to be watching them, both for overfitting and also for, for the underlying data patterns changing. Yeah, so um, I, I think that on the sort of engagement side where we're trying to reach out and uh, actually survey people, it's just an ongoing matter of trying to discover um, and using field work uh, and our own sort of expertise in development and, and other areas. Uh, what do people use? How do people talk to each other in some areas? Um, you know, there are some areas where news is primarily shared via like song and dance, right? Um, and so that's something that we need to know um, if we really want to figure out how important discussions are <coughs> happening. Um, from the side of trying to catch bad guys, as it were, um, I, there are constantly changing, you know, techniques, tactics, um, procedures. So I, I think it's kind of the cost of just working in the area um, is is constantly working with the end users, the investigators, the analysts to see uh, where are people going? Um, are people moving from you know this platform to somewhere else? Generally, criminals, uh, what, I, what I found is they use some combination of the opposite of Twitter and uh, whatever is really convenient. Um, so you know, a lot of uh, folks want to just look at Twitter to find all kinds of bad data and predict things. Um, that's probably not going to work. So by looking at a lot of different communication channels, um, we are often able to find discussion of where people are moving to next or what uh, sort of strategies they plan to use in the future once they realize that some method uh, is no longer going to work for them. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's really something that comes from the operational community. Um, the question earlier about image recognition, you know, finding phone numbers and emails and pictures because they realize that everybody is going to be scraping phone numbers from plain text. Um, it's, yeah, it's a feedback loop. Um, tomorrow, as James mentioned, there's going to be um, a lot of discussion of challenges and how do we move on challenges. So maybe as the closing, if you can each sort of say one thing that is a significant challenge. You can start if you want, if you're holding the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, really broadly, um, this year, there are going to be five billion people in the world who have mobile phones, um, and that number is only going up. More and more people are going to be communicating digitally. Uh, that's a great opportunity, um, but it's also a huge challenge. Those communities are all fragmented, not just by language, but by um, customs, by the, the ways that they use these devices, by what networks they're on, you know, if they're on a 3G connection or if they're on Facebook or um, so accessing these communities digitally I think is a, is a really incredible opportunity but 
there's a constant risk that if you're making policy based on what you find from, you know, Facebook or what you find from Twitter, um, you're going to miss a huge amount of the population, and you're at risk of, of causing more damage um, just by doing that. So it's really important to try to get to people uh, in ways that work for them and, and get as, as broad a cross-section as you possibly can with tech. I have a lot of challenges. It's hard to pick just one. Um, I think that um, something that really stays with me every day as I work on this problem is, um, I guess as Donald Rumsfeld said, um, the unknown unknowns. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what really concerns me about that are my known unknowns. Things like um, when I'm doing these prevalence estimates, do I have a reliable way of reaching women, for instance? Um, and are they, are they showing up in my operational data the same way? Or linguistic minorities? Or, you know, like, you know, I can see in the operational data how often I have to discard a piece of data because it's just irreparably misspelled or something. And, and that happens when a linguistic minority is using a system that's not designed for them. Um, so I guess, you know, that group of known unknowns to me makes me always worried about the unknown unknowns. Um, for me, I think, um, because we work with a lot of different types of frontline responders, understanding the different motivations of the different types of frontline responders. So some maybe NGOs might get funded by finding lots of people, um, but maybe a Ministry of Labor <laughs> might not want to find a lot of people. And so managing this whole, yeah, different motivations <laughs> for being in this space. Let's thank our speakers one more time. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I think it's lunch, is that correct? And then we're back at 1.30? Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone.